Welcome to SATCONS 101, an educational activity of the International Astronomical Union's Center for the Protection of the Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference, or CPS. This activity aims to promote factual understanding of large satellite constellations in order to help participants come to reasoned and informed opinions about this important social and technological issue. Today's topic is impacts on the Earth and space environment. The Center's mission is to coordinate efforts and unify voices around the astronomical community with regard to the protection of the dark and quiet sky from satellite constellation interference. My name is John Barentine, and I co-lead the Community Engagement Hub of CPS. My training is in optical and infrared astronomy, and my current professional work involves freelance consulting. Since 2019, I have worked on policy and advocacy issues around large satellite constellations. I will present to you on today's topic. These are the learning objectives of the SATCONS 101 curriculum. Participants will gain exposure to these ideas in the course of viewing all of the presentations in the series. Opportunities to learn more about any given topic will be offered in each module, as well as to contact the Center for further information. SACONS 101 is a series of learning modules covering eight broad subject areas. Each module is a short, self-contained video presentation covering one of the subject areas. They can be viewed individually or in any combination up to the full set. Viewing all eight presentations constitutes exposure to the complete SATCONS 101 curriculum. Today, we will focus on the topic of impacts on the Earth and space environment. In the next few minutes, I will discuss each of the following elements that relate to the topic of this video. The process of delivering satellites to their orbits and disposing of them at the end of their missions has effects on the environments of both Earth and space. Launch sites and their surroundings are often vulnerable to harm associated with the earliest phase of launches. Rocket launches generate a considerable amount of sound whose high volume and low frequencies can harm wildlife. The act of launching a rocket is itself dangerous and can result in explosions and fires at launch sites. Rockets that fail during launch can fall back to the ground in uncontrolled ways. And operations at launch sites can contaminate the air, water, and soil in and around those places. Pollutant spills can persist in the environments for decades, potentially long after the launch site closes. Regulators in launching states consider such consequences when writing rules that operators must follow in order to minimize harm associated with launches. Engineering innovation may help minimize some of these effects. For instance, the controlled return of reusable rockets to the ground or to sea-based platforms helps reduce the influence of hardware that is destroyed during re-entry or disposed of permanently in the ocean. As a rocket moves away from the launch site and transits through the atmosphere, it continues to impact the environment. Air traffic must remain clear around the site to ensure the safety of aviation. And the exhaust from rockets puts materials into the air that have effects on atmospheric chemistry and the climate. Rockets fueled with liquid hydrogen and oxygen produce copious amounts of water vapor during ascent. This is the most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Other fuels, such as highly refined kerosene, generate other greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. They also emit tiny grains of soot known as black carbon, nitrous oxides, and sulfur. Concentrations of these pollutants in the mesosphere, the layer of the atmosphere at altitudes between 50 and 80 kilometers, can remain elevated long after launch. Circulation in the atmosphere dissipates those gases and eventually brings their concentrations back down. It is important to note that the carbon contribution of rockets to the atmosphere at this time is small, accounting for only 1% of the carbon footprint of aviation. That number may be higher in the future as the annual number of launches increases. 
and we do not yet know how long concentrations of materials in the atmosphere remain elevated. We also do not know how long those materials change the temperature of the mesosphere. Further study is required in order to better understand the significance of these concerns. There are also concerns about how satellites affect the Earth's atmosphere and oceans at the end of their missions. Satellites can fall back to Earth in ways that are more or less controlled. An increasingly common approach to disposal of satellites considered responsible is to deorbit them. As they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, they are subject to friction with air molecules. This raises the temperature of their materials. Some parts will become hot enough to partially or completely vaporize. The material leaving the satellite in this process is often shed while it is in the upper atmosphere. This is particularly concerning because of the presence of metals like aluminum and titanium that are there can change the flow of heat through the atmosphere. This may impact weather on local scales and the climate itself on global scales. Additionally, most satellites do not fully burn up during re-entry. What remains after re-entry returns to Earth. Current best practice is to direct re-entering spacecraft to places like the South Pacific Ocean. This is to avoid objects causing damage over populated areas. But this preference may well result in ocean pollution. Besides their other materials, satellites sometimes have toxic materials on board. Disposal of satellites in the world's oceans may have harmful effects on marine life. Sometimes operators of satellites lose control of their spacecraft. This usually results from equipment failure or damage due to collisions with other satellites or pieces of space debris. When this happens, satellites can become derelict and uncontrollable. They may pose a collision risk to other satellites, generating even more debris. Once control of a satellite is lost, it can no longer be maneuvered to avoid such collisions. The current best practice for avoiding this as much as possible is to properly dispose of satellites when they reach the end of their missions. This involves either boosting them to a very high orbit or actively deorbiting the spacecraft. Operators are investigating the possibility of extending satellite missions through on-orbit servicing by repair spacecraft. This approach can refuel aging satellites to extend their useful service lifetime and enable their safe deorbiting. It may also enable better control through augmented propulsion. The breakup of intact satellites is only one way to generate space debris. Fuels and batteries can explode. Satellites, both functional and derelict, can collide with existing debris fragments generating new ones. Rarer still are direct collisions between satellites that can completely destroy them. Sometimes the destruction is intentional, resulting from tests of anti-satellite weapons launched from the ground or space. There are also other sources of debris besides satellites. These include pieces of launch hardware, such as disused rocket stages or launch vehicle adapters. Even flecks of paint and bits of insulation shed from satellites or hardware can become debris-threatening satellites. Successive collisions produce smaller and smaller pieces of debris. Some have theorized that debris collisions can become a runaway process. This so-called Kessler syndrome could make the orbital space near the Earth unusable. Orbits occupied by excessive debris may also make it impossible to safely transit through these areas. Thank you for watching this presentation. For additional information about this and other subjects related to large satellite constellations and their impacts on astronomy and the space environment, contact the center at the address or website shown here.